Hello and welcome to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Rubin speaking to you from south of Jerusalem, here in the beautiful, holy, sacred, blessed land of Israel. Today is the 14th day of the month of Elul, 5784. It's September 19th, 2024. This coming Shabbat, we read Parshat Kitavo, When You Come Into the Land, from the book of Deuteronomy, beginning in chapter 26, verse 1 and concluding chapter 29, verse 8. Uh, a lot to talk about in Parshat Kitavo. If last week's Parshat Kitetse was sort of a mixed bag of of all sorts of different commandments, different mitzvot, that there didn't seem to be an obvious uh, central theme, this week's Parshat Kitavo is very, very focused and has a very, very central theme, which we'll be getting to and talking about in just one moment. But first, being that it is the month of Elul, uh, we are going to blow the shofar as we do every morning during this month, a wake-up call, a wake-up to ourselves to remind ourselves that this is the time, special time, a special time that we have been afforded by our Creator to focus on who we are, who we've been, who we want to be, who we need to be and what we're going to do about it uh, in the upcoming year, which is in just two weeks. So it is a super intense month, but it's a very, very positive month because Hashem wants us to be our best. And as we know from the parable, uh, the Hasidic parable of the king in the field, Hashem is out in the field now. He left his castle, he left his palace, uh, which, you know, is sort of foreboding Anybody who wants to visit the king in the palace, you know, you have to have the proper protocol. You have to have an invite. You have to speak just the right way and present yourself the right way. But no, in the Elo, as the parable goes, Hashem, the king, he leaves his castle and he goes into the field. The field, of course, is our domain. It's where we live. It's where we live our lives. It's where we are who we are. And Hashem wants to see us as we are. And so don't be surprised this month if you get a tap on the shoulder and and you turn around and you find yourself in the presence of the king, in the presence of Hashem. Don't be surprised. Don't be startled. Don't be afraid. Just be yourself. That's what Hashem wants. He wants to see us as we are. He wants to see us who we really are because that's what he wants us to be, who we really are. He created us to be who we really are. And, you know, we get lost uh, throughout the year. We get lost in all the demands of life. We get lost in all the expectations, all the things we want to be, all the things we want to do, the people we want to be in with, the crowd we want to be in with, uh, the status we want to achieve, this and that. And it can uh, lead us to forget who we really are, who we're really meant to be. And so now's the time, Elul, to remind ourselves and to return to who we were intended to be by Hashem, and that's who we really want to be. And so, let's hear that wake-up call now. Wake up. Wake up, my soul. Wake up and show me who you are. Let me be who I need to be. That's the wake-up call, and we hear it every morning on during the month of Elul. It's a minhag. It's a custom. It's not a Torah commandment. The commandment in the Torah is to blow the shofar on Yom HaTru'ah, which is the Torah's name of Rosh Hashanah. It doesn't call it Rosh Hashanah, the, the head of the year which is a literal translation of Rosh Hashanah. It calls it Yom HaTru'ah. Rosh Hashanah was a name given to that day uh, many years after the receiving of Torah. Torah simply calls it Yom HaTru'ah, which means the yom, the day of the sounding of the shofar. We'll be talking about that more as we approach Rosh Hashanah. But uh, right now, let's, let's stick with uh, Elul, and the sounding of the shofar during Elul, which, as I said, is to wake us up out of our torpor, 
out of the sleep that we've been in perhaps through this year or have been lulled into uh, as the year progressed. Uh, as far as the news here in Israel, just the other day we uh, intercepted uh, a missile that came in all the way from Yemen. The Houthis again uh, have attacked us. We are still in Aza, Gaza, and have been uh, killing really by the hundreds terrorists and destroying uh, terrorist strongholds, whether they be in UNRWA buildings or not, many of them are in schools, hospitals, and uh, destroying tunnels. Um, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, have discovered more than 200 tunnels under the border between uh, Gaza and Egypt. 200 tunnels in a length of border that's about 14 miles long, maybe, if that long. And there are still more. They haven't all been uncovered yet. In the meantime, Israel has uh, officially and formally made returning the residents of the north back to their back to their homes in the north for, for a year now. Uh, oh, about eighty thousand people in the north have been displaced. They're living away from home, away from the border, because of the missiles coming in and the drones coming in from Hezbollah. And Israel's been. Uh, at war with Hezbollah. Hezbollah declared war uh, in Israel the, the day after October 7th, the day after we were attacked by Hamas, and ever since has been sending in missiles and drones uh, into Israel's north, uh, thousands of them throughout the year, and Israel has been retaliating, and as of late, Israel has been intensifying its attacks in southern Lebanon and some in not so southern Lebanon at destroying missile sites, destroying uh, ammunition sites, destroying uh, different uh, military uh, facilities of Hezbollah as, as well as killing many terrorists including many top key terrorists. But Israel has announced that this now is officially part of the uh, war plan which means, and we all know that in order to achieve that uh, we need to go on the attack in Lebanon, within Lebanon, southern Lebanon. We really need to take southern Lebanon and hold it. Um, and the American government uh, has sent their envoy here just this week, and Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, said, um, this is what we're going to do. Thank you. We, uh, we appreciate your support, but we're going to do what we need to do. Meaning, of course, we're going to do what we need to do, whether you like it or not, and whether you uh, will back us up or not, uh, we're going to do what we need to do. So that's going to happen probably soon. It's not the first time Israel has said that we're going to go to war against uh, Hezbollah, but uh, this time it's a little more official, it's a little more certain, and we all know it's going to happen one of these days. And uh, now is probably as good a time as ever, uh, perhaps a better time with the United States in election season, then um, there may be fewer um, repercussions from the American government, which hasn't exactly been a very um, conducive to Israel's achieving our war aims. They're very, very supportive of us defending ourselves, but as far as destroying Hamas and returning security to the north, which means going to war in Lebanon against Hezbollah, they have done their darndest to confound us in those efforts and to uh, keep coming up with alleged plans and deals that we just have to sign and everything's going to be hunky-dory. Well, been there, done that. So that's what's happening here. Um, and... Of course, in the meantime, we are all approaching the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, a very, very serious time of year, any year. And of course, this year, it's going to be, for Israel, um, a very, very, very serious time of introspection due to the events that have happened over the past year, which began during the holiday season of Tishrei last year. We have lots to think about. We have lots to uh, mend. We have lots to... Correct. We have a lot of work to do here in Israel as individuals and as a society. And um, 
you know, the the motto throughout the year is uh, united will win. And that is true. And the Torah tells us that all the time. As long as we're united, we're invincible. But um, staying united is a challenge. And unfortunately, there are those amongst us here in Israel, a minority, but a loud, aggressive, and powerful minority that uh, keeps trying to tear us apart from one another. And we mustn't let that happen. This week's parsha is very, very relevant to all that's going on. And let's read the first few uh, verses of Parshat Kitavo in Hebrew, then in English. Vahaya. I'm in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 1. Vahaya ki tavo el aras asher Hashem elokecha noten lacha nachala virishta v'yashavta ba v'lakachta merishit kol pri adama asher tavi me'al tzacha asher Hashem elokecha noten lach v'samta v'tene v'halachta el makom asher yivcha Hashem elokecha l'shaken shmo sham Uvata el kohen asher yihye v'yamim ahem v'amata elav Higadati ayom la Hashem elokecha ki vati el aretz asher nishba Hashem lavotenu latet lanu v'lakacho kohen atene miyadecha v'inicho lifne mizba Hashem elokecha v'anit v'amata lifne Hashem elokecha arami oved avi v'yered mitzrayma v'yagosham bimte maat v'yehi sham lagoi gadol atzum varav. It will be when you enter the land that Hashem, your God, gives you as an inheritance and you possess it and dwell in it, that you shall take of the first of every fruit of the ground that you bring in from your land that Hashem, your God, gives you. And you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that Hashem, your God, will choose to make his name there rest there. You shall come to whoever will be the Kohen in those days, and you will say to him, I declare today to Hashem, your God, that I have come to the land that Hashem swore to our forefathers to give us. The Kohen shall take the basket from your hand and lay it before the altar of Hashem, your God. Then you will call out and say before Hashem, your God, an Aramean tried to destroy my forefather. He descended into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, strong, and numerous. And it goes on and on as... This uh, vidui, it's called a confession, that the pilgrim makes, bringing his first fruits to the holy temple. Uh, Basically, a a quick uh, uh, review of Israelite history. What's this all about? Well, of course, it's referring to the first fruit offerings, the bikurim in Hebrew, that we bring on Shavuot, which, of course, is 50 days after Passover, after Pesach, and... Um, it is a beautiful, joyful ceremony of of bringing the first fruits that have grown in our in our orchards and our fields during the this current year. And actually, since not everything is ready, ripe, or even ready on Shavuot, the bringing of first fruits takes place all throughout the the summer season, even. Uh, I think even up to Sukkot and maybe even after in certain cases. Uh, but the ceremony uh, is, is said specifically on Shavuot. And, um, but it's very beautiful because it says when you enter the land. So every year on Shavuot, which is also the holiday of the receiving of the Torah, it's also the holiday of the first fruits and also the holiday which celebrates the entering of the land. Entering the land of Israel is the first step of of becoming a nation in Israel, and in fact, um, in this in this confession that we we read, it says uh, he, meaning our our father, descended to Egypt and sojourned there, few in numbers, and then he became a nation, great, strong, and numerous. Yes, in Egypt. As we know, Pharaoh first called us a nation. He said, this nation is becoming too numerous for us. We have to oppress them. We have to destroy them. And that's exactly what he did. And that's what this confession goes on to say. Um, But here we are at the Holy Temple, a place that Hashem will choose to arrest his name there. Um, And uh, we are bringing the first fruits, this gift, gift that God gave us. He brought us to this land. And yes, we, we plow the fields and we... 
we tend to our orchards and we do a lot of work um, in order to grow the crops, in order to raise the, the fruits and the grains that we're bringing as first fruits. But nevertheless, it's all a gift from Hashem, and we can never forget that. Gratitude is the key to success in life. It's the key to remaining humble. It's the key to happiness. It's the key to a nation's security and safety. And um, it is key. So after Parsat Kitavo uh, describes this beautiful ceremony and then goes on to a quick uh, discussion about tithing, the different masurot, the different tithes, etc., it focuses on another ceremony, and that is um, instructions that Moshe gives to Israel once she enters the land, again, once she enters the land, and that is to go to Mount Eval, which is in Samaria, Shomron. Uh, Mount Eval and Mount Grizim are two mountains that are on either side of the city of Shechem, today known uh, to much of the world as Nablus. It's the city of Shechem, and on that mountain, uh, Moshe commands the people when they get there to uh, erect stones, or first to erect stones in the Jordan River itself, and to write on them the words of the, of the Torah. And then, of course, to do this again on Mount Eval, where they were also are instructed to build an altar. And um, and uh, you shall build an altar of whole stones. You shall build the altar to Hashem, your God, and you shall bring it up upon it burnt offerings to Hashem, your God. You shall slaughter peace offerings and eat there, and you shall rejoice before Hashem, your God. Rejoice, being happy, sameach. It's a key element of the Torah, key element of our avodah, of our worship. And we're going to read about it again and discuss it again in a few minutes in another context in this same parsha. And you shall inscribe on the stones of the, all the words of the Torah, well clarified. And again, uh, in the book of Joshua, we read that they did this very thing. In the book of Joshua, chapter 8, verses 30 to 35, we read, Then Yoshua, Joshua, Yoshua built an altar to Hashem, God, of Israel on Mount Eval, as Moshe, the servant of Hashem, commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moshe, as we just read now, right? The book of Yoshua of Joshua is referring to Deuteronomy, what we just read, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel, and all Israel and their elders and officers and their judges stood on the side of the ark and on, a, and on that side before the Kohanim, the Levites, the bearers of the ark, the covenant of Hashem, the stranger as well as the native-born, half of them over against Mount Gerizim and half of them against Mount Eval, as Moshe, the servant of Hashem, had commanded to bless the people of Israel first. And afterwards he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, according to that as which is written in the book of the Torah. And there was not a word of all that Moshe commanded, which Yoshua did not read before the congregation of Israel with the women and the little ones and the strangers that walked among them. And Moshe declared on the day that the people assembled on Mount Eval and fulfilled these commandments, they will become a people, Am Yisrael. Pay attention and listen, O Israel. This is the day that you will become a people to Hashem your God. So this ceremony is an affirmation, of course, of Israel's commitment to the Torah, but it's also it's it's the the day we became a people. It's sort of the bar mitzvah of the nation. Um, it's not the first time. Again, you know, um, as we said, uh, Pharaoh himself called us a people while in while in Egypt, um, and and you know the covenant of of the Pesach of the korban Pesach of the Passover offering was really. Um, a covenant that, that made us into a people, as was receiving the Torah. But here were the people in the land. This is the change now. Now we're a people in the land that we have been instructed to, in, in to, to conquer, to inherit, and to settle, and to dwell, and to prosper within. So now this is it. We really are at the, we are at the point where we can fulfill all the aspects of our covenant with Hashem, to be a people, uh, that is that is dedicated to Hashem, to a people that is dedicated to Torah, and a people dedicated to life in the land of Israel, which 
the land of Israel itself is the key to the performance of a third, no less than a third, of all the commandments of the Torah. So without the land of Israel, mm, we don't quite make it. And yes, we're in the land of Israel today, and uh, we are able, even today, to fulfill many, many, many of these of these, of these, these uh, commandments that are relevant to the land of Israel, including the Masroth, including the tithes, and including many other agricultural things which are fulfilled today in the land of Israel. There are certain things that we have not yet reached um, at the point where we are able to fulfill them. For example, the Yovel, the Jubilee year, although we do fulfill the Shemitah years. And... Um, that's the difference of being in the land of Israel. And that's why here, when Israel finally made it to this point under the leadership of Yoshua, that um, they really have earned the title of Am. Am meaning a people, a nation, Am Israel, the people of Israel, or the nation of Israel. Um, you hear the expression Am Israel Chai, the people of Israel live. Am Israel, it's a huge title that um, like everything else in life is a privilege and a responsibility. We need always need to fulfill the responsibilities that, that grant us that title of being an Am, a people. And the Torah goes on right after describing the building of this altar to the ceremony that was referred to in Yoshua which is a ceremony on, on Mount uh, Eval in Grizim, where the uh, blessings and curses are, are recited, six of the tribes on, on one mount and six on the other, and the, this Kitavo, our, our Torah reading, uh, 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 has a list of the curses which are, which are listed. A curse, your, uh, curse is the person who doesn't fulfill these commandments. And... Um, we read them here, and what's exciting, and I've posted a few things already on Facebook this week about this, is that A, uh, about 40 years ago, the archaeologist uh, uncovered, discovered the, the uh, Mizbeach, the altar that Yehoshua built. It's on Mount Eval. It's a huge altar. It looks like an altar. It looks like the Torah description of an altar. It's in fairly good shape after all these years. And um, it seems to be some uh, pretty uh, ironclad proof that this event actually took place as Moshe commanded it to take place and as Yoshua fulfilled the commandment, Yoshua and the people of Israel. There it is. It's still there today. Uh, it's in the Shomron. It's near the city of Shechem. Um, in recent years, the Palestinian Authority has uh, made attempts to damage it. They have damaged it to some extent and uh, have tried to encroach upon it. And, of course, their aim would be to obliterate it. Uh, we mustn't let that happen. It is one of the most crucial, important historical uh, remnants that we have in the land of Israel, among many others. But you can see why it's so important and so crucial because of what we just read. It's It marks Israel's entry and, and uh, conquering and commitment to the land of Israel and to the Torah of Israel. Um, so, yes, uh, I've posted about it and uh, you can look up... Uh, you can simply look up Altar Mount Ebal and uh, you'll find uh, many articles about it online and many photographs. Uh, it can be visited. Um, it's not an easy place to get to, but it can be visited. And hopefully, God willing, uh, we will... We will... Um, Israel, the nation of Israel, will be uh, paying a little more attention uh, as we move forward and secure it as a place, a uh, historical site for people to visit, because it is extremely important. Uh, another amazing thing that was discovered, and I also posted on uh, Facebook, uh, it was discovered just about a year ago, I think, 
and that is um, they discovered on Mount Ebal, right there near the altar, uh, a tiny little a piece of lead, apparently, with an inscription on it in the ancient Hebrew script uh, that says, I hope you're sitting down. I hope you're sitting down when you hear this. It says, Cursed, 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 cursed by, by Hashem, cursed, Cursed by by God Hashem, you will die cursed. Cursed you will surely die. Cursed by Hashem, cursed, cursed, cursed. Now, what did we just talk about? What did we just read about? The ceremony of the curses. Listing of curses. So, this seems to be another uh, link in the story and in the proof, historical proof, uh, that this really took place, this ceremony. It seems that it was a one-time ceremony, but um, it definitely took place. And make of it what you will, um, uh, it wasn't just anywhere that they found this inscription. And the inscription itself, they believe to be about 3,200 years old. So that uh, takes us to a fairly ancient time. So you can... Um, you can connect the dots again in the uh, in the post on Facebook. I added a couple of links to some very interesting articles that really go into depth about the discovery. And so, uh, this very important uh, ceremony, which took place thousands of years ago when Israel first entered into the land, um, is alive today in the. Uh, alive today in the form of the altar, which still stands, and this inscription, uh, which was discovered, and it brings it to life. And this is all about Israel becoming a nation. You know, all these clowns in the world who uh, think that they can weigh in on whether Israel has a right to exist, whether we're a people or just a religion or, uh, you know, they don't know anything. They're ignorant. They're ignorant, and they're either ignorant or willfully ignorant. They're either stupid or willfully stupid, um, or it's filled with uh, poison or hatred that they don't want to see. But there is no nation on earth that has more historical proof and history of being a nation. we it, The nation of Israel basically defines what nationhood is. We have all the elements. I don't say this to be boastful. I say this simply to, to state the facts that uh, Israel is a nation uh, with our own, our own religion, with our own understanding of life, of the universe, of creation, of who runs creation, and we, this little nation of ours, on this little piece of land in the Middle East, yes, has had a very, very influential, uh, has been very influential on the rest of humanity, that's for sure. And much of humanity has, has uh, learned from and adopted and adapted much of, of of our literature, of our sacred literature, of our history, and uh, that's all well and good, but um, uh, uh, we need to be respected, and uh, our history needs to be respected, and who we are needs to be respected, and the fact that we are an indigenous people in this land with our own culture, our own ethos, that has to be respected. So here we are, Kitavo. Now, after all this, we read about all the blessings that Hashem will bless us with should we maintain His Torah, shall we keep true to His Torah, shall we fulfill the commandments, the mitzvot and the chukim and the mishpatim. And that is a short list, a very beautiful list. And then, of course, there is a long, painful, horrible list of curses of bad things that will happen to us if we decide to uh, jettison the Torah, jettison the, 
of God's commandments and not do them. And again, this is the second time in the Torah that we have such a, a short list of the blessings because you don't need the blessings. You, you know, they're, they're clear. You don't need a lot. You just need the blessings. Uh, you know, fruitfulness and health and prosperity and peace. But the the curses, there are many. And this is the second time in the book of, toward the uh, conclusion of the book of of Leviticus, which, of course, when Israel was also preparing to enter into the land of Israel, uh, just before the sin of the spies, and then their plans were thwarted for 39 years. So here they are again, about to enter, enter into the land. And so Moshe finds it very important to present to them you know, their future, should they decide to be true to Hashem or they decide not to, go after other gods. And if they go after other gods and leave Hashem, horrible things happen. It's a long, long, drawn-out list. I think it's 96 uh, verses. I think it's twice as long as the list in uh, in, Deuter- in in Leviticus. And it's not pleasant, and usually when it's read in synagogue, it's read in a low voice and quickly because we just want to get through it. We don't want to dwell on it. And certainly these curses have have actualized throughout our history when we haven't done what we needed to do. And what's really painful reading it today is that some of the things just uh, send a chill when we look at what's happened to, to us here in Israel in the, over the past year. And... Uh, the message is you gotta stick with the Torah. You have to, you have to do what you have to do. And what's very important is toward the end of this list, um, there's a very important uh, sort of a brief, a brief hiatus um, in the list, and it says um, I'm in chapter. Chapter 28, verse 45, I'm going to pick up. All these curses will befall you, pursuing, pursue you, pursuing you and overtaking you to destroy you because you did not obey Hashem, your God, to observe his commandments, his statutes, which he commanded you. Okay, we understand that. And then, and they will be as a sign and a wonder upon you and your offspring forever because you did not serve Hashem your God with happiness and with gladness of heart when you had an abundance of everything. And I read that in Hebrew. When you had everything, when you were blessed, when you had it all, you didn't serve Hashem with happiness and with a gladness of heart, meaning, yeah, you did it, you did it, you did it, you know, you did, you were mechanical. Yes, it's not just enough, people. It's not just enough to fulfill the commandments. That's not the point. The point is to do it with happiness and gladness of heart. And like I said before, happiness and gladness of heart are so important to to our to to Judaism, to to, to the Torah. It's so important to Hashem. He wants us to be happy. And happiness, we, we, we become happy when we perform the commandments. And when we are grateful and feel gra- grateful and sh- express our gratitude toward whatever we have, whenever we have it. You know, they say a wealthy man is a man who is happy with, his, what, with what he has, satisfied with his lot. If he can say, whatever I got, that's what God has given me, that's what God wants me to have, I'm grateful for that, I'm happy for that. That's the secret. That's the key to life to be happy with what you have, not to be always longing for something you don't have or envious of those who have something you don't have. Yes, it's good to strive. It's good to want more. But always, at every moment, be happy with what you have. That's all God wants. And if we can do that and be that, then we won't be cursed. We stick with the sin and we express always our gratitude for all that He has given us. Thank you so much. Temple Talk.